everyone. Welcome to Indicted TV. I am your host, Negra. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and follow us on Instagram. Also, we got to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, Royalty Honey. Make sure you guys use the promo code Negra and get your food. Also, if you do, if you do not want to be on my show and you want to stay home, make sure you hire Attorney Rosenberg. On today's, <laughs> <laughs> I hope he's giving you a penny for that. I hope he's uh, no, he is. <laughs> on today's episode, we have Johnny the Connect. Thank you. It's Mitchell's the last name. But, uh, you know, The Connect is my podcast. Yeah. yeah. I just didn't want to say Mitchell, you know, but we got Johnny Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you. No, Welcome you should to want indict to. It. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. You guys got a nice little operation going. I'm impressed. I am glad you're impressed because, <laughs> you know, white dudes are kind of hard to impress. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, we've seen it all. <laughs> we've done it all. We're pretty much finished. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so tell me, where are you from? Where did you grow up? Portland, Oregon. Born and raised. Born and raised. Yep. Okay. Um, how was your upbringing? Your oh, brothers, was, sisters, mom, dad together. Yeah, it was the best. It was like it was ideal. You know, it was like that classic kind of, you know, middle class America that so doesn't that really exist anymore. And it, but it was different because it was the '90s middle class. So it wasn't like uh, being middle class in LA where. You could make a million dollars a year and you're still Bro. you're not really rich because yeah. the cost of living is so insane. But this was back in the 90s. So Portland was I mean, it was still very white, but it was it had diversity. So we grew up in like a gentrifying neighborhood like we were like one of the first white families in like a black neighborhood. So oh, we wow. began the gentrification. Uh, sorry about that. Northeast Portland. Uh, but it was just great. Like it was, you know, it was before technology and cell phones and, you know, we played a lot of sports and, uh, yeah, it was just, uh, it, it didn't match what happened to me later. So the inside of your house was amazing. And the only reason I say the inside of your house is because I always ask, so how was the inside of your house? <laughs> <laughs> so if I don't say that, they're going to be like, oh, what? so she wants to ask everybody else how the inside right. of the house was, but not the white guy. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a lot of white guys on this show, do you? Yeah, I do, actually. I have. You? Yeah, I've had like three, four. And how have their, they, well, how are the insides of their homes? Not like yours. Right. Not at no, all. I can't imagine. Not at no all. No meth whatsoever in the inside of my house, if you Good. can believe it. Good. It was like we had wood floors, you know. It was did like it creak? A, Just kidding. Yeah, they did. It was an old <laughs> house. <laughs> they did creak. So you couldn't sneak out like the parents would wake up, okay. you know. We did anyways though. I'm sure. You know. So uh yeah, no, it was nice. I would you know, twenty five hundred square feet, basement. So so you did finish school, you graduated. Yep. You did all of that. Yep. Good I stuff. went to I went to the University of Oregon oh, in nice. Eugene. Uh, and that's where I got into selling dope, you know what I mean? Uh, cuz it was like the back then this was like maybe 5, 8, 10 years before weed eventually became legalized everywhere. Okay. But that was like the gold rush. Like I talk about selling weed in Portland, it's akin to like the crack era for black guys in the 80s. That's how selling weed was. So Got even it. like middle class dudes would like catch a break and blow up and become like millionaires nice. off of selling weed. And I, I thought that was just like incredible. And you're in school. Yeah, yeah. But, it, you know, that was where it all began was like, uh, I mean, in high school, you know, we became potheads and shit. And so you would buy a little bit to try to sell it and you'd fuck up the bag, you know, and, and it was you like. You tried that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, but college was where it really like became a business. Oh, wow. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah. So we would just, you know, just started off like everybody buy-in like a quarter pound uh but back then you could come up off a quarter pound so we would you know flip that and you know tens and twenties and and the little bags right uh it was never it wasn't like that we would sell it in sandwich bags oh, okay. and have them wrapped like like uh long uh lengthwise okay. like horizontally because okay. it looked bigger in our in our mind we were like it was always like it was like marketing okay. we were always thinking marketing so and for years, we would, my strategy was like, let's just get the customers in. Let's get all the customers. So we didn't make any money because okay. we would give people more than what they paid for. So they could come back. And so, because I, I was like, I just want repeat customers because someday we're going to get a better price and that's how we're going to be able to make profit. Ah. So yeah, it was a long slog. 
It was not. I did not have a silver spoon in the dope game, you know. Okay. So I, I put in my time. So, but you had a silver spoon at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, Dang, yeah. you still wanted to f*** up. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, but it wasn't like I was spoiled. Like, we weren't rich. Yeah, you know? just normal. Yeah, it's try, I try to explain this to people. Like, my, uh, you know, we drove like a, we had a minivan. That's the kind of family we were, you know? I just pictured you guys. <laughs> 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 like in the movies, like, hey, guys, <laughs> we're moving in. <laughs> oh, black people are like, shit. <laughs> uh, shit, like, no, shit, yeah. Shit, our rent's going up. Dead actually, dead. no, we uh, we helped the black families in our neighborhood owned, so we actually nice. helped their property value go up. So you know what? You're welcome. <laughs> that is terrible. Okay, so you're you're in school and you start selling uh, yeah. weed, mm -hmm. and um, you weren't really profiting yet. You no. just wanted to get all the clients, exactly. keep going. How long did you do that for? Probably took like a year and a half, two years before we like became, you know, we stepped up and bought a bigger sack and then you become the dealer's dealer, right? And you hit off the street dealers. Um, yeah. And then, you know, there was all, all kinds of drugs back then, you know, selling Coke, selling shrooms because, you know, if the weed dried up because, hey, the youth won't be able to believe this, but back in the day, uh, the, the pot supply would actually dry up. Yeah. All the weed that got harvested in yeah. Southern Oregon and Northern California would get smoked up by like August or September before harvest time. So you would, dope dealers would actually run out of product. So we would switch to like, you know, we'd go like, you know, get hit off with like four ounces, nine ounces of, you know, mm -hmm. yayo. And we would, you know, we would move that. And so it was like, uh, those were like the scrambling times. But then we finally met uh, like a wholesaler you know, a grower mm -hmm. who had like the, you know, the, the fields whole... of weed. And that was what changed everything. Wow. Yeah. Tell us more about the changes. Yeah. So we had a couple of plugs. We had, uh, we had these like redneck, yeah, I call them rednecks just affectionately. They were just good guys. These, these working class people in the hills of Ashland, Oregon. It's this tiny little, pretty little town right on the border uh, of California. So we would drive down, you know, two and a half, three hours from Eugene, and we would draw, all, go all the way up this, you know, the side of this mountain, and we would go through a gate, and there'd be a bunch of barking dogs, and you know, a guy with a shotgun, and you know, I, I told these guys, Do you have like a ducktail. What's that? Do you have like a no, ducktail? No, no, no ducktails. <laughs> these guys were like old, just weathered white dudes. You know what I mean? F missing teeth, spitting tobacco. Uh, and it, I told them, Hey, well, look, show me something. And they, they bring me into this little garage and they just, you know, open up these gigantic Tupperware, uh, and, and you know, it's just hundreds, oh hundreds goodness. and hundreds of pounds of weed. You and it was so like, happy. Oh my God. I mean, it was just, I could cry thinking about it. It was the happiest <laughs> day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and so look they were like look we can i was like well we can move as many as you want to give us so uh so that's where you know you start to that's that's where you really start to scale the business so yeah so the biggest risk back then was just driving it With from it, yeah. from there up to eugene uh so we would you know pay people to go down and and we would switch up uh you know Everybody cars and, shit like that. and stuff like that yeah yeah and then eventually you know we had uh, when the cartels used to have people that would grow like that, we would we'd have them as connects too. Ah. So they they don't operate there anymore. How but, did you uh, connect with the cartel? Just you know, random through, shit. Just random, yeah, just a random connect. But it was good to have two or three growers because then you could play them, play the prices off each other. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, because you won't give this. This guy will give you a higher price. Or you're like, nah, I'm gonna go here. And then he saw that you were go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. He's like, okay, let me lower it. Exactly, and okay. especially by the end, by like 2010, you really saw the growers start to like panic a little bit because there's way more supply and they can't get as much per per pound. So they really, you know, then they're like, hey, we'll drive it up to you. And I'm like, great. And so that's that's really when the middleman. Like like us, we had the the most leverage, you know. So it was a real sweet spot. Like business is there's so much about timing and, and, did and you luck smoke involved. Too? Yeah. Oh okay. Yeah yeah I yeah I was a I was a pothead. I wasn't like a crazy pothead. I was way more about the, the money. money than anything else. I'll tell you that much. 
Like I would party, but when we were like in the coke game, I never, I never would party. Like I'd be in Colombia partying, but when, all- <laughs> when it was, but when it was my money on yeah, the line, you're I didn't. The real Colombians partying, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but when I was like really, and this is before fentanyl too, so you didn't have the guilt. Yeah. So so, but I never, when my money was on the line, I never touched it. So just good. You're smart. Yeah. So money always trumped. Uh, the drugs, but you know, money, that's its own kind of addiction. That's, that's probably in many ways worse than drugs. I understand. Um, I have it to this day, but at least I'm putting <laughs> I think it to productive does. use. Yeah. I think everybody does. Yeah. You know, everybody wants more. No matter how much you have, you always want more. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So tell me, you're obviously on indicted. What happened? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so we started um, 2009. We started shipping weed to different buyers. Everywhere. Uh, yeah. So we started, you know, we would put it in u-haul trucks we would put it in like mobile storage units those started to become a thing they're called pods i don't know if you've mm-hmm. seen those you know you would you you would stuff a, a storage unit with like 30 pounds and then you would write like a f- an address for some guy in new jersey and you would use fake ids and then you five days later it would land at the spot that you shipped it to oh, right wow. and we used fedex and in, in the mail and shit like that oh wow yeah so we had we had a little operation going and you know, it was like good business. It was like, you know, we were doing... How long was it going really well? Maybe like a year and a half. We oh, were making shit, like, so not even that much. Yeah, but you know... I mean, that long, We were making say. like, you know, 40 or 50 Gs a week profit. Oh, like, wow. So, so, you know, it was, we're rich. We, got, we made it. We made a million bucks. Like, yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's to good. us yeah. back then, that was a lot of money. For sure. So, uh, so, yeah, and to this day, I think the cops lied in the discovery or they left stuff out. I, absolutely, they they omitted things in the discovery paperwork, but the long and the short of it is, uh, one day, one of our connect, one of our buyers, right, one of our clients on the East Coast, New York City, uh, sent a package of money back, right, because you work gets shipped east, money gets shipped back west, and and I, I knew. These guys weren't as sharp as I would have liked them to be. Like we would open up packages sometimes with like forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars in it, and it would just reek with weed. Like it smelled like they would were smoking blunts as they were counting oh, up. Oh yeah, blowing it over the oh, over the dollars, no. like over the bills. And I would tell them, I'm like, hey, you guys got to wrap the money like I wrap your work, you know. But uh, so I think, you know, possibly what happened is they. Uh, you know, they didn't wrap the money like I told them to. And in when when the money was in like a, you know, the, the FedEx like sorting facility on its way to the West Coast, you know, a drug sniffing dog hit on the package of money. So they were able to trace that money to me in Portland. So uh, oh. so I went down to the FedEx facility to pick up the package of money. Uh, I picked it up and I put it, you know, tossed it in the car, in the car that I was driving with another package of money. <laughs> I mean, it's just insane, right? It's like $100,000 that would just come to us. That was routine. And, um, and as I'm pulling away, I noticed like these unmarked cars starting to follow me. So, you knew. so I hit it. I just said, nah, I'm, we're not doing this today. I, I got a flight to catch. I was flying out to... Columbia that night. You're not gonna to go, go party. To go meet no, I was going to meet a sh- going to meet a shorty in Columbia. I'm like, nah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, boys. We'll do this when I get back. And so I I took them on a. I won't say it was a high speed chase because I hit. I was driving like a Dodge Charger at the time, and I was in my own neighborhood. And I so I was literally stepped on the gas. I was going like a hundred through the neighborhoods, and I I saw them turn on their lights. And then as soon as they saw me going that fast, they just backed off, right? Because they knew they, they the, noticed that you noticed them, right? Exactly, and it's also liability too. Like I, I was talking to my lawyer about that. He was like, "Yeah, they, they usually when they try not to give chase through like residential areas like that because if they hit somebody and kill them, like they're also liable." Yeah. So I was like, "Okay." So I so I parked the car. I didn't know that. Yeah. So I so I parked the car. Uh, you know, in a little cut, right? And I waited till it was dark. I went back to my parents' house. 
you know, to look through the blinds like a crackhead. And I thought, <laughs> and and I had a I had a spot where I lived like, about a mile from them, and no and nobody knew where I lived. Nobody knew where I lived. I had a nice like townhouse, you know, living above like an old lady, and it was really nice. It had a view of the Willamette River downtown Portland. And I thought, okay, I'm just gonna go back there and and see what's what. And uh, nope, they knew where I lived <laughs> because they were waiting for me. They were lying in wait, and so they just wow. swooped down on me. Um, but you still had everything stashed, or you still had everything in the car? No, no, I had moved the money from the car, but there was money in my House. in my apartment. So, I mean, it took hours. They were like, you know, just let us search the crib, and I was like, nah, you got to go get a warrant, buddy. But I mean, that was worse because it, you know it takes four or five hours. And then somebody warrant. has to stay there, huh? Of course. So of you course. couldn't even like stash anything, even if you wanted to, because yeah. there's somebody there with you. Correct. Uh. Correct. So, um, so you know, it was like the it was like the Portland, it was like the local pigs, it was the like the, the drugs and vice squad. But then by the end, you know, I got DEA in my in my apartment, and it's you know, it's a scary thing. Uh, they didn't find any work though, but they found a bunch of cash, <laughs> and they found. Um, you know, like packaging material and shit like that. What did you say the cash was for? I just, I was so, I was so shocked. I was in such a uh, panic mode that I just shut down. Mm. I was like, I, I was, cause, cause I had already been in trouble a year earlier. So I knew I had my lawyer on speed dial. So I was like, this is going to be my first phone call. But I was like, I know they're bringing me in. Oh wait, well you didn't tell us about the first time you got in trouble. Yeah. What was it for? Okay. Sorry. Uh, I just skipped to the juicy part. Uh, I got, so the cops raided me. Um, they raided like a, a stash house we had and they, they found like six pounds and like a couple thousand bucks. Oh, so I so was already on, on already I was on felony key. probation. That's the big no, no. And when you get caught for, you know, e either way, even if I had beat the second case I caught, my probation would have been revoked and I would have gone and done time anyway. No matter what. Yeah. So, uh, so my lawyer was like, yeah, there's not much we can do for you here, but they were trying to tie me in with like a bigger, because they found all this cash. I mean, they found hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. They were like, oh, we got a whale. Like, we have somebody. Big. Yeah. So they were like, you know, look, you, we, can, we can kick you out on the street right now. Just bring us to your cartel people. Um, it's not even the cartel. But it wasn't <laughs> even the cartel, you know. I mean, I guess I had, you know, some Mexican guys tied in in Northern California. But, like. You know, I was like, I'm not going to, there's no way I'm going to do that. They didn't, you know, I just wouldn't have done it anyways. I was scared That's of those put guys. The red lights for you. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks. I appreciate it. I got PTSD now. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, you know, I tried to bribe the cops at oh, one point. Shit. Yeah. Punk, they're f dorks, though. Well, cause, okay. Because at one point, before all of the, like, everybody showed up, it was just me and three dudes. Oh. And they were like white boys, not that much older than me. They're maybe in their like, late 30s. And I'm like, guys, come on. Just level with me. Just, just, it's just us. Your, your captain's not here. There's like 300 G's. Take this and just let me run. I'm not saying, like, just say I got away. Just <laughs> give me a day. That's a good deal. <laughs> That's a good deal. Yeah, you know what everyone I mean? gets a hundred. So th thank you. I'm like, go f put your kids in private school. Yeah. Nerds. Yeah. If this had been the East Coast, they would have taken it. But these are like nerd. These are like do-gooder Boy Scout, Northwest Portland white boys. You know what I mean? So, anyways, good guys. so they charged me with They're bribery. Good guys. They're, They're not good, good guys. Their job. Ah. Uh, <laughs> you know what? You know what? Now Johnny. weed's legal, and they're <laughs> working at a dispensary because you're out of a job. You losers oh Anyways. so you know exactly who they are now no i don't know i assume <laughs> i assume they are though because think about it, now that the weed the dea doesn't have anything to do now because up, especially Merrill, up there huh yeah like up there like that was kind of like a major thing for them like getting all these little weed people but it, but it was everywhere though but it was every marijuana was 70 percent of the dea's business and now it's 20 yeah. percent and you know there's obviously like hard drugs still right but that even though it's sensationalized in the news and stuff like that, it still makes up a small percentage yeah. of the drugs that are actually used. So, but that's why the, the feds don't want to. They're Do they're they're praying that drugs stay illegal because they they don't want to be out of a job. That makes sense. You know, of course they're on the we're on the same side. I mean, I didn't want drugs to be legal either. Yeah, I'm like guys. No, no, no. We're no. on the same team. Honestly, so it's. I don't, 
I don't think it's a good thing to make it illegal. Like it's I, these kids are on, we're all up on drugs, bro. Right. Like I seen this guy. Um, he said like I seen like a, a like a post or something, and um, this guy his legs were cut off, and he only oh had God. a few days left of life, and all because of pills. Wow. I don't know what happened to the guy. I don't know anything. I just saw the post and I read and I was like, man. And these kids are literally f like, like see, they're not even able yeah. to move. Like, who so you think you don't think drugs should be legal? No. Huh. Yeah, but I mean, look, drugs were illegal and and you, you know, I was on a sick one. Yeah, you were on a sick one. So <laughs> so the laws don't stop people from using. No. Now you I can guess, say I guess you're right. There definitely has to be regulation though. You can't just let it be San Francisco. You can't just say. Use all the drugs and or that place in um, where's that place at? Um, we want it, we want to go there where it's legal to sell drugs. There, babe, what is it called? That place where they sell drugs and you're able to sell. Well, Amsterdam, and oh, Baltimore. right, right. But is that a real place or is it that is just a real on place. season three of The Wire? No, it's a real oh, place, oh, yeah, okay. And it's just in that little area, right, right, where it's legal, right? Well, essentially. That's what the tenderloin is, though, uh, okay. uh, in San Francisco. And, and Skid Row, much the same, right? It's low level. Yeah, I guess you're right. You know, because we, they know that they're right there shooting up and smoking crack yeah. and they don't do anything to them. Yeah. So, I, I, yeah, I guess yeah. It's, you're right. It's true. We were up filming in the tenderloin for the Connect last December. And, dude, I felt way safer in Sinaloa with a bunch of cartel dudes than I did on the corners of San Francisco. Uh, it's a bunch of Honduran kids that gets smuggled over by the cartel, you know, and they don't have any money. So what they do is they go onto those corners and they sell heroin and fentanyl. And then shit. they can't get them off because it's legal. It's low level, low level. Yes, there are sweeps every now what and then. From, are they really from Honduras? Or you're just yeah, it's weird. They're, it's a little, they, 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 you know. My sons from my sons have Honduras. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So they, But they find out that, hey, we can sell dope on the corners of San Francisco and even if you get arrested, you're going to get kicked out ah. the same day and they just tell everybody back home. And so then, everybody goes there. Yeah, it's just okay. like how, you know, everybody from Guerrero found out that, uh, you know, Drew Street was the place to be. Like, that's how ethnicities. Got it. I get, know, I, I get it. I get that's it. That's why I ties do nails. One person did it and they told all of Thailand, hey, there's money here. And everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't uh, so, yeah, out. I don't know. It's tricky, but like it definitely the solution, like making drugs illegal doesn't stop. The drug use. The drug use. Yeah. You know? That's terrible. Let's yeah. get back to you. So, so anyway, so so Daddy got arrested that day. They didn't take the bribe <laughs> and they put the cuffs on. <laughs> How did you feel? Um, like, you know, I was like, I, I mean, I felt a sense of relief because I was, when you're operating at that level, you're just like, it's nonstop stress. Yeah, it's nonstop stress. Um, so it was like, oh. It's like when you're, you know, cheating on your girl or whatever, you know, not, not that I would ever do that, but you know, <laughs> it's like, like she finally catches you with all those DMs and you're like, oh baby, I, I know. I love you. Oh I'll, yeah. Let me I go be you. in the doghouse. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me a week on the couch. Send me to the I'll couch. accept it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, um. It was hard, though, on the family. That's the hardest part, right? Especially because they thought you were this good boy. Now, they always... Not that you were a bad boy, but, you know, you yeah. were just making bad choices. Yeah. Not bad choices. You were just making your money. Yeah, that's what it was. But they they had known on and off for years that I was doing that. Oh. But when all this came out, that's when they were like, God damn, what was our son doing? Oh. And even my dad, who's like, you know, I never had a good relationship <laughs> with, and he, he really, like, was... You know, uh, he's a real like strict old school like Catholic guy. When he found out all, I had all that money, he was like, "Wow!" He didn't fucking he was like, give did me you any put, food. Did you? He was like, "Did you put some of that away?" <laughs> like he was, he was really he's like, down. "Oh <laughs> shit, he's down." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's really when you find out how much your parents love you is when you go away. You know, um, but yeah. So, so, so did you put some money away? Yeah, but they got a lot of it, and I, I spent a penny on I'm a lawyer. Sure. Like, like I really no holds bar. I call him the fat man. And he's this obese guy named Gorski, this Polak, gigantic fat. F and I was like, no, this guy's a winner. If he's got that much money to eat, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> dick. so I spent, yeah. So, so, you know, I, they, and they give you a public defender like automatically when you go in. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't even want to talk to you. You're so fired. Like, it's, like, I don't, I don't care what you have to say. Cause you know, you get on the, but I was like, okay, I'll talk to him. Cause 
it's just like before I get a hold of like my real lawyer and they're just like going casually on the phone. They're like, yeah, you know, you're looking at maybe six or seven. I was like, oh yeah, six or seven your mother and just hung up like it's i'm not trying so to hear me, that so let me ask you so you got arrested and where did they take you so they book you at the multnomah county justice center downtown portland it's a it's a that's a scary place why is it scary um just because you know it's not dorms it's like going to the you know the twin towers in downtown like it's you're locked up 23 hours alone uh and so it's just, uh, you know, they put like terrorists there. They, they, it's like they house everybody there that's uh, a high security level. And so it's just ominous, right? Uh, and then I was there, you know, for about two weeks, which is a long time when you've never really done any real time. Yeah. So, and then they, you know, they sent the DEA down a couple of times, like, hey, we can, like, we'd love to work with you. you yeah, know, I'm sure they we would. We like you, John. <laughs> 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 you want to be in the Johnny Mitchell business, okay? It's like my agents in Hollywood, right? Yeah. Um, and I was like, I, I, you know, and I talked to my lawyer and he was like, look, even from a practical standpoint, even if you did want to cooperate, like it, they don't have a great case. So I would, I would recommend not doing it because you're going to have to cooperate and they got to, the, the, the feds. You have to they, do time. They say you're done when you're done. Like, you're done when they say you're done. Yeah. So they could say, hey, all we want is a couple of names and, like, a phone number. But then you could, we could give them that. And then they come back and say, well, actually, we're going to – talking's not enough. We're going to need you to do some walking. So it's, he's like, I, I would I – would, I know you want I – know, I know you don't want to cooperate anyways, but I would, I would definitely not recommend going this route because they're trying to tie you in. They think you're, like – trafficking heroin with uh the cartel and you just they just they're trying to get you to break because they don't really have anything they have mm -hmm. a bunch of money that's all and they're asking you a bunch of questions and my lawyer was like look if they're asking questions that means they don't know shit, shit yeah. so just let's just keep it like that so so it was good advice so you don't you just got to hang on and so after a couple of weeks they stopped sending guys down and they're like okay you're these charges we're gonna hand this over to the we're not going to make a fed case out of it so they handed it over to the state and uh so after they, the two weeks where did you go so i go in for a bail hearing they deny the bail of course you're on probation, yeah, probation hold. so so it's probation hold you get no bail and so they sent me to uh the county it's called inverness and that's just where everybody's in bunks and you, you know, you're in different you're wings. And I thought I wasn't going to be, but I was much happier because I just, I need to be around people, you know? I'm a people person as well. And, but it's like, I hate everybody in here. I don't relate <laughs> to you, but I need you right now. But so, what, you, what makes you say you don't relate to them though? Because well, obviously you're in there. Yeah, I'm in there. You're right. And that's like a bougie, kind of like elitist thinking. And, and I was kind of just saying that in jest, but I don't relate to the, most of these cats because like, so first they put me in like a pretty high security wing and that's where you're in there with dudes like this guy's from Culiacan and this guy's from Colima and this guy's from Nayarit and I'm like, oh, what are all these Mexican guys? You're I belong with these dudes. Exactly. Well, and they're all there because they got caught with yeah, meth, major. Yeah. you know, meth, heroin, etc. Some people working in the weed fields and shit. Uh but yeah, you're like, you're, everybody's reading their paperwork. And I'm like, yeah, I, I do. I relate to these guys more a little bit. Yeah, I know? understand. I understand what you mean. I'm yeah. Fucking um, but, your balls. but then but then they the longer I'm in there, they move me down to like a lower security. And that's when I'm in there with junkies and yeah. and people that are in there for Grand Theft Auto and 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 probation violation. And that's that's actually a lot, in my opinion, a lot worse. Yeah, because fucking people just fresh from the streets oh. they just shovel in there and they're withdrawing and they're screaming at night and you just smell the dope coming out of them oh yeah and so it was uh that was uh i was like i'm ready to go like let's just sign and go yeah let's just sign and go how long did you uh, fight your case for <sighs> eight eight and a half months and you were in the, this dorm living yeah eight months yeah i was about half it was about half and half it was about four in the higher security and then okay four in the lower so um but you know you always get cool with people like you know you meet some fascinating people no, and, for and sure <laughs> just characters you're and like then as soon as they sober up and become their own person yeah they 
Right. They're like so different. Like yeah. they speak different. They look different. They are like, uh, what is a fascinating people? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, I read a lot and, and that's where the first, and I'll never forget. I had to, I got in a lot of fights though too. So well, I, I was going to ask would you send that. me to the whole, you know, wait, what do you mean you got in a lot of fights? You didn't look like a fighter. Yeah, but no, but it's the, immediately as soon as I got there, as soon as I got to the, you know, 12 hours in after intake, when I was locked up at, in, at the Multnomah County jail, um, <sighs> I, I had to fade. They were like, "You gotta, you gotta go fade." Why? Because I just, I just got there. They didn't, I know, and what they does that were, mean? Like the white boys were like, "You're not gonna live on on the main line unless you go fade with this guy." Oh, yeah. Shit. So you were with obviously you're white, so you're yeah, with the whites. Yeah, and I was like, "Oh no, no, no I'm no, no, no." I'm not, <laughs> I was like, "I'm not like you guys. <laughs> yeah, I'll pass." <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. And they were like, "No, no, no." And they're like, "We grant valid, but you can't pass." And so. Or you're going to have to, like, we're going to run you off. And then you're going to have to go, like... And they, did they explain to you, like, hey, if you're not, if you don't take this fate or you, if you're not going with us, then you're not going to have protection? Did they, do they explain all no, of that? No, they were like, we're just going to run you off. Like, we're going to beat you down. And then you're going to have to go be in the hole even more isolated. You're going to have to go, like, hey, PC me. Oh, right? Protective I see. custody oh, yeah, yeah, And I was yeah. like, well, I definitely don't want to do that. Yeah. So, and I was already, like, I was mad. Like, I was... Now, like, the hurt and the shock had worn off. And now I was, like, getting puffed up. So, so I was like, yeah, okay, let's fade. And, and this, this big bald white dude, you know, he had done time. Like he was a real, like, you know, he had done life on the installment plan as uh -huh. they said. Yeah. And so, yeah, we just went in the bathroom and we and got it on for like a minute. The cops broke us up and they were going to take us to the hole. But up? then we, what's up? No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> I, he didn't put me on my pockets. I stayed on my feet. <laughs> I get the, I, I get the, I get the first shot in. So. That was like the best. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That made it like a decently fair. You know, he still got the best of me, but but that he's was a pro. Like a, you know, you're just getting you're just getting the feel. You're like not yeah. yourself. You're like, yeah. you know, you just had to take off. Exactly, on him. exactly. But I'm also six foot six, so it was like I'm not like a victim. So that's at least okay. you know, thank yeah. God for the height. So after that, but we ended up being in the same penitentiary together, oh, and wow. we're actually cool. Nice. You know, so because he knows what it is. Yeah, exactly. You know? But sometimes, like if I was. If I was, you know, in the in the the pod, like the the dorm, I would get so sick of people sometimes. <sighs> just, I I'd get in a fight just so they'd send me the hole for thirty days, mm. you know. But uh, it was just like, man, it's brutal. It's the roughest time, and uh, and they keep you in there, you know, I, intentionally sometimes to try to squeeze you, to try yeah. to torture you, yeah. to try to get you to take a deal yeah. that they want. So. My lawyer was just like, hang in there, big okay. fella. So what, what would you say was the worst thing you saw while you were fighting your case? Um, just beat downs. Normal shit, right? Just, just county jail, like beat downs. Um, you know, but when we got off the bus, we got off the Grey Goose going to Two Rivers. That's when I saw a dude get hit. What is Two Rivers? Is two that Rivers a was the correctional facility where I, I eventually, you know, did went. most of my time. Okay. Um, I was also at OSP, Oregon State Penitentiary, for, for a, a minute. But, uh, yeah, this dude, we were getting off the, the bus, chained up. And as soon as they took the black box off this guy, he turned and he hit this guy. Like, he hit him so hard, the dude ended up dying. <gasps> so I just witnessed oh, a murder. Wow. But, yeah, but that dude had bad paperwork, and this guy coming in had life. So oh, he was, yeah. like, Might just well. trying to, yeah, yeah, give him another life sentence. So yeah, that was like I was like, oh, I wow. was like, what have I done? <laughs> I was like, what have I done? Yeah, that is kind of crazy. Yeah, so I would sit there, I'd be like, wow, this shit's gonna be legal in two years, and I'm like, fighting I'm like for your life, doing time with murderers. It was it's pretty surreal. So what did you, you end know? up getting sentenced to? Money laundering, money laundering, and probation violation, um, and they dropped the bribery charge. Oh, they told. What's that? That you were trying to break Yeah, up. yeah, punk ass cops. Oh shit. Yeah. So but you know, they charge you with everything at the beginning. Yeah. And I'm but it's it's like their word versus mine. There's yeah. no you know, they didn't yeah, have body cams on. Yeah. These were undercovers. So uh so yeah, no, I I I uh I signed for thirty six months. But how did they put the how did they make it money laundry? Cause all this cash. This all this it, you know, like we maybe could have fought it, but there was no I have no you know, it was either that my lawyer was worried that like the feds were going to come for tax evasion. Got it. So what we did is like he said, look, we're going to give this over to the DEA voluntarily 
so they don't make it a Fed case. Oh. So the Fed's got my money. The state got my life. You know, got it. Got um, it. It's fascinating when you like this what they're able to do. So yeah, I signed for thirty six months, and uh, but I got the drug. I got a drug program after like what fifteen months. How was that program for you, especially because you weren't an addict like that? Yeah, dude, I know. My my lawyer was like, just give him some. You just, have just say sometimes you're, it's good just so you could re- they could remove some time off, yeah, yeah, and things yeah. like that. Yeah, they were, he was like, just make something up. Say you're you know a fiend. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was like, okay, cool. So after fifteen months, I did the drug program for for six months. Did you feel while you were doing the drug program that did you were you able to relate in any form? Uh, like, did you actually work the program? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, no. I enjoy AA meetings. I, I, we went to AA and, and NA and we, and, and these like cognitive behavioral sessions where I, I still think about a lot of that stuff today and I enjoyed it. I think, I think the program is a good way to live, even if you're not an addict. addict yeah. I think it's just a good, it's a good way to like, calm down it's very you know they take a lot of that stuff is borrowed from like eastern religions zen buddhism right Mm -hmm. it's about living in the moment and doing your best and relinquishing your power yeah you're you're trying to you have almost no control in the grand scheme of things over what happens to you so when you give that up as in like an addict would say i'm powerless over this like i'm you, what you're doing is you're removing your ego, which is, uh, you know. Because the egos will mess us up. That's right. That's right. So I love that. I thought it was fascinating. And I did a lot of reading. I read like some great, some great, I just, just couldn't, couldn't get enough of just anything. At, my parents were constantly sending me in books. Um, but that's when I started writing comedy and like screenplays and shit when I was oh, down. Yeah. And I was like, God, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to Hollywood. That was my big idea. <laughs> Hey, you thought you were going to just be this big old writer. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so let's go back. So you get sentenced and you get sent where? Uh, well, you know, you go to the holding facility, which is this, it was a female prison in Portland, They, which is where they send male inmates. There's a wing where they send male inmates. It's called Coffee Creek. And they, you know, they house you there. Like a well, reception type. Exactly. While well, you're looking, they're looking for bed space for you. I'm going to send this guy here, here, here. Got it. So I was, I figured, okay, they're going to send me to like, uh, you know, I'm going to go straight to like a, a minimum with like a tennis court and <laughs> ice cream. <laughs> right? No, it's only in the feds. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, no, that's true because, uh, but I'd also had a bunch of fights too. So my security level was now like the highest it could be. So they're like, no, you're going to go to a max. Oh, you're shit. You're getting sent to a max. So that's. I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. So it just kept getting worse get and worse. I had probably five while I was in county. Okay. But, uh, but who cares, right? They're fights. Like, I didn't have any weapons on me. Um, but then, yeah, so they shot me. So, so I, I went to Two Rivers Correctional Facility, which is probably, I, I'd say it's like the third worst prison in Oregon. So, you know, like, uh, it was bad, right? Like, we we had, you know, we always had access to knives well here let's back up so they put me on the gray goose i mean i saw a guy get murdered my first day right Mm -hmm. so uh it was no easy place to do time um and you're a wood no i wasn't affiliated with anybody okay so you're on your own but my but but my celly was a shot caller for the hell's angels oh wow so and and i to this day yeah he's and this is crazy and we'll, we'll work up to what happened to him he might be alive. He's on death row right now, and I'll explain how that happened. But uh, his name was Jimmy, and I tried to figure out why they put us together. And Jimmy was like, it's because you're the softest guy here. It's because you're the guy that's not up to anything, and I'm the guy that's up to everything, right? So it's, you know, because this guy had been in the system for 30 years. So every facility he would go to, he would organize and he, he would, would do a sting. exactly and then so they so they try to send these they try to move those guys around as much as possible so um but yeah so i did my time how did you with feel him. when you when they put you in there <laughs> your face when they put you in the room and you like he told hey my name is like how, how did he introduce himself like how does how did that work well i saw the big giant 
Hell's Angels wings on his back. He was doing push-ups and shit. And uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, f-. I was like, here we go. But uh, he was a real, you know, he was a chill guy. He was a mellow guy. Guys that know they're never getting out. They've lost all their appeals. Like they're, you know, they've, um. yeah, they've accepted. So, but he was on his way out. He, uh, he was having problems. He had over a lot of people in his time, right? Mm-hmm. So, anyways, at first, Jimmy was like, he kind of broke it down to me. He's like, look, you're going to, you, there's a, it's a privilege being with me, right? I have the keys to the yard. I mean, our cell looked like a 7 Eleven. <laughs> we had all the snacks, unlimited commissary, canteen, um, you know, unlimited access to drugs if I wanted. Uh, it was meth and weed. That, those are the drugs that were making its way out there, right? Uh, but he's like, you're going to have to, you know, put in some work. So Did you're you going to have to. What's that? Did you hoop anything? Yeah. I w- was hoop play basketball. No. Did you put anything up your butt? Oh, keister. We call it. Yeah. You, did you keister? Y- did anything? I keister? Yeah. Yeah. I had to keister okay, so a you, few times. So you put in work. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. I had to keister a few times. Uh, sometimes he would, he would say, Hey, you got to bring this, you know, you got to bring this knife over to this section of the yard or whatever. Um, so but he saw <laughs> day after day I would be like writing screenplays and jokes and I was going down to the talent show nights that they would have and I didn't even know it was stand-up comedy I was doing but I was just trashing everybody <laughs> and I was f- killing <laughs> like I was doing like impressions of the warden and it was like brutal too it was, it was probably racist um, in, in this day and age but everybody loved it so when he saw it made that, him laugh. Everybody needs exactly, laughter. Exactly. So good for the exactly. Soul, you know? And it changed me. I was like, oh my God, this is powerful. Like, this feels so good. And uh, and Jimmy was like, oh, okay. He was like, what what are you what, what is this? And I was like, well, I confided in him. I was like, I, I want to go to Hollywood when I get out and I want to be like a, an actor and I want to write and I want to perform. I, I, I don't really know. But does that make sense? And he goes, okay, yeah. He was like, you're. He was like, "Okay, well, you gotta, you gotta get out of here." I, I, you ha- and that from that day on, he never made me carry anything, never made me keister anything. Um, he, he was saw like, "Just it in you, that yeah, you know exactly." It's not, um, it wasn't. It's not. It's not for everybody. That lifestyle, it really isn't for everybody. Yeah, no. And he saw that in you, and mm-hmm. he didn't want to. He didn't want to hurt you. Yeah, and he was a good. I think it was like his way of like doing right after so long. So, anyways, that's very nice. I, and this is what's out of a movie, is that, I swear to God, it, two days after I got shipped out, classed down from, from the max, and I, I, they sent me to the drug program, this tiny little nice facility on the Oregon coast, they send this new guy on to, intentionally for sure, he was a rival, they put this dude into the same... Uh, cell block as Jimmy and he came at Jimmy with a, like a shank and Jimmy fucking cracked him boom hit him snapped his neck back the guy fell back and hit his head and died just like the guy that I had seen my first mm-hmm. day in and so they charged Jimmy with uh, murder and they were trying to put him to death but I think he beat his case because it's so so clearly uh, on the other guy so, so clearly but but yeah dude they I mean he languished on death row for a long time That's and in fact nice. when I was out they sent uh, one of his lawyer, the lawyer's assistant in L.A. found me and came and like talked to me and wanted to get like a character reference and shit. But but yeah, I mean. Oh, so you never really reached out to Jimmy? No, I didn't. I didn't. I, I when I first got out, I wanted to put the life behind me so much. I never talked about it. Never talked about it on stage when I was doing comedy. Never never told anybody about it. I was very. I was very uh, ashamed of it, I guess, or I, I don't know. I didn't want that to be my identity. So it was only after I found out how many views you could get on YouTube that I really, <laughs> uh, that I really started to exploit it. Well, maybe it was that you actually, like, for exa- like me, I didn't really feel comfortable doing this or talking. I always talked about it, but actually talking about it and being open until, like, now. Yeah. You know, until, yeah. a- until I was able to. Yeah. You know? How many years after has this been? It's been since 2011, 2012. Right. When you so got it's out. a long time. That's when I got out, 2012. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think the generations have changed. And now the attitudes towards drugs and incarceration and crime uh, have the pendulum has swung. Mm -hmm. So America's always been obsessed with crime, but now there's a nuance to it. And even middle Americans, white people from you know the middle of the country, they see their kids getting addicted to fentanyl. And so they have empathy for drug addicts. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people understand that most drug dealers even are, you know, addicts themselves or, you know, just doing it as a way to supplement their income. So there's and uh, they really are just supplying a demand, an insatiable demand. So there's you know, it's uh, it's much more acceptable now. It definitely, you know, to have that kind of past. Right. I agree. I agree. So, you know, you know, in the comments, people are always like, why are they so obsessed with talking? Why didn't you just leave it in the past? Because people need to hear. Mm hmm. Like, what does it bring to the, how does it help the people? Yeah. Maybe they'll grab one word from what we say that will make them not want to or prepare them. Because if you're in that path, you're on that path. Yeah. And there's nothing that no one could say to stop you. Well, I would definitely say that if you were, uh, you know, giving kernels of wisdom here, if we want to make it all sappy. (laughs) (laughs) I uh, if I had gotten away with all that money, man, life would have been so sweet. So I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) But he didn't. And life is still sweet. Yeah. Life is definitely, you know, I when I went in. I was like, okay, I want to really dedicate myself to something when I get out. Like, like, let me find out if I can make money doing something that I actually like doing. I was like, God damn, that's so, I was so envious. I was like, people that actually uh, make their life's work, it's not even work because it's just what they love doing. Yeah. Let me just see if I can do that. Let me just give myself 10 years. Like, let me really see if I can, because I'll tell you what, if it hadn't been for the game, right? If it hadn't been for the hustle and and drug dealing, I probably never would have been able to go after my show business dreams because, dude, I didn't think, you know, people used to say, yeah, you become what you think about, right? It's in the Bible. What man thinketh, man mm-hmm. become. Mm-hmm. Well, when I got locked up, when I had the DEA in my f- apartment but uh, you know what i mean i was like yeah. wow i really manifested i i built in my head I, th- this you know because every person kind of builds their identity in their own head i was like I, you became this drug you know kingpin and you in accomplished a way. it and i accomplished it so i'm like what if i put my mind to something else mm-hmm. and just dialed in and yeah. you know it's what i'm doing now stand-up comedy you know youtubing podcasting having some success it's not exactly what i set out to be doing when not I was yet first sitting in the day room right i wanted to be i wanted to write and and perform in you know hollywood pictures but in a way what i'm doing actually now is more aligned with who i am so you know you just follow like the path takes you off a little bit you don't know exactly where it's going to go but you just worry about what's two feet ahead of you, mm-hmm. you know? i agree yeah i agree okay so you get to your drug program yeah you said you did the six months. Yeah. It was <laughs> like, but but people would get to like month five and they would like get in a fight and they would have to go back and uh, st- start the six months over. Yeah, that sucks. Uh, because you have to behave, well, you have to behave very different when you're in yeah. the drug program. Yeah. I don't know if the drug program is the same as in like for the girls or whatever, but like you have like big sisters and little sisters where, you know, the big sisters in charge of like four girls right. and like a mentor type of thing, right. you know? Yeah. Did you guys have that? No, it wasn't like that really. Um, you know, guys aren't as No, I'm just kidding. Um, take that part out. Don't, don't roll your eyes, Christina <laughs> Cruz. Um, no, it was not quite like that. It was, everybody was in a car. Kind of, kind of like a like, kind of like a prison car, but it was a a unit. Okay. And so, yeah, I guess you would talk to the people that had been in the program longer, and you would get advice and stuff like that. But we really, it was a group of like fifteen of us, okay. maybe less, twelve of us, and that's it became like a fraternity. You know, we Got were it. actually pretty very close at the end, and I'm still good friends with one of those guys oh, today. Nice. Yeah. Um. So that's really what it, it wasn't about mentoring. It was about you know, sticking together Together. as a unit. So, yeah. And I mean, a few people didn't make it, unfortunately. Um, But, you know, that's just what it is. But yeah, it was, uh, that was, it was fun, but it was also kind of annoying. I was like, you know, 
because because when, when they made us like go pick up trash on the side of the highway because we'd have to do shit like that too. oh so you would you would be able to leave the yeah, prison we would leave the facility yeah this was ah. like a minimum I, you could just jump over the fence it wasn't even like barbed did wire. you have visits uh yeah you could get visits did and stuff gr- like that did you have girls visit you <laughs> no oh come on just my did mom you, did you have pimp house i didn't i just i didn't really care about girls. women back okay then. i had a bunch of like you know colombian women <laughs> Yeah, and they couldn't come. Colombian women, and wow, <laughs> boy, what a shocker! When I when I went down, they were nowhere to be found. Oh, <laughs> hey, they probably missed you, and they were probably like, ah. No, know. they were like, there goes my green card. <laughs> <laughs> but how did you speak to them? Uh, in Spanish. Do you have a Colombian accent? Down there, I would have a Colombian accent. Like yeah, how? I would, I would Let me see, like how? Um, que más, que más parte? Como va, como vas? Yeah, because they always say parche. Huh? Yeah, parche. Como, como vamos? Yeah, and they're like very calm. Mi amor. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, very, you like uh, to be called mi amor, huh? Yeah, yeah. I thought it got a little much, you know? <laughs> but um, I'll tell you what, for you Mexicans, I mean, that Spanish is... Seriously, you you're a... But, but I actually, I, but I do enjoy, I tell you what about Mexican Spanish. They, you can bullshit easier in Mexican Spanish because they're so crude that it feels like I'm speaking English, but yeah. in Spanish. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh-huh. Whereas, like, uh, you know, if you wanted to joke about pussy to some Colombians, you know, they're no, like, hey, man, that's a little... Vulgar. That's a little vulgar. Yeah. You're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? We're sniffing blow off each other's <laughs> right now. What, what, what vulgar? So, yeah. so I, I would say, yeah, Lat- Latinos, Latin America, they have this veneer uh, of... Uh, this, they, they they put on airs. They put on a front of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, class. Mm-hmm. But Mexicans do not pretend to have any class, which I enjoy. We're just ourselves. Yeah, yeah, with class. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> exactly. We're yeah. just ourselves with class, guys. Yeah. Oh yeah, you have a lot of Mexicans <laughs> listening. I'm just joking. I'm a <laughs> I honestly love. You're my favorite, obviously. You know. Um. So yeah, no, I didn't have any pen pals. I mean, I I wrote. To, I had a lot of support from the community. Like like. You know these nice Portland white people nice. or whoever no, yeah. would write me in. Like they didn't. There wasn't a lot of judgment, you know. Um, so that that was like touching, right? Yeah. Like because we we're not so stuck up, and we weren't so like it wasn't like a rich community. So it was like they understood things happen, you know. Um, so that was that's what meant the most was like my boys, my people. You know, like we grew up very tight. Like and my male friends. And they were there for you. Yes. Oh, yes. nice. They, and they would come visit. They put money like in your that. books, all of that. Yeah. They yeah. put all oh, your money in your books. Yeah. Well, I, I had some money. Yeah. I lived pretty good. <laughs> like, I didn't have to hustle or anything like that because I, I had cash. Oh, so I told, my, I told my mom, you go take this money and you put, put it all in my books. Don't worry about it. So that was, I didn't have a typical prison experience where I had to like. I understand. You know, I didn't make spreads. I didn't. Um, oh, so you never ate a spread. I would make a spread that somebody would, I would pay for you yeah know? you i understand what you mean but uh you know most people in prison uh, and understandably have to have a hustle hey i steal pastries from the bakery and sell them <laughs> or whatever you know yeah i uh i didn't i wasn't down long enough to really uh need a hustle uh, or or develop a, a super routine you know um except for that chunk of time when i was sold up with jimmy like he would make me like work you out. know work out he would make me. Uh, Jimmy you know, was down, huh? What's that? Jimmy was down. Yeah, for sure. Jimmy, Jimmy know how to knew how to do time. Uh, yeah, you got to learn how to do time. You got to learn how to bid. Yeah, you see, Christina, mm. got to know how to bid. And uh, <laughs> there's a lot of faux pas and things like that. Like I would wake up, I'd come out of the cell with my hair up, and they'd be like, "Go back in there and comb your hair." And I didn't understand it at the time. I'm like, "Why?" It's just what, men. What? F- is? <laughs> yeah. What, for the, the, the CO? Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, what am I? It's, it's all dudes. And they were like, no, no, no. It's about yourself. It's about, yes. And you're a representative. We have to maintain a level of decency, I suppose. Yeah. And I'm like, I just walked by a pool of blood from some guy getting, <laughs> That doesn't you know, matter. Come I, right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. We're exactly. going to go down. You're going to go down looking smooth. You yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> I get my little duck tail. I should have got a duck tail. No, I can't even see you with one. What? I can't see you with a duck tail. Really? I could only see you with the duck hair. With the duck hair, I know it's just like a duck's ass. This hair, it's so gross, guys. Oh I, guys, I'm gonna look great in six months. Okay, so please don't judge. Take it easy on me in the don't comments. Don't worry, this guy's dope. Appreciate it. Yeah. So, um, 
uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a very interesting time. And looking back now, I mean, I'm like, God, it, it almost seems unreal, like it never happened. But it all happened. For sure, you know? yeah. So you got out. Um, what it, what did you do? What have you been doing since you've been out? Yeah, so I got out uh, beginning of 2012, and I was on like you know house arrest more or less for like not house arrest but a uh, work release for like three months. You know where like they test your piss every week, uh-huh. and it's like real strict, like no fuck. It's ups. like worse than being in jail. Yes, exactly. And like you, one fuck up, you're gonna go back and yeah. do the rest of your time. Did you fuck up? No. Oh good, good. No, 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 no. So. But, you know, I feel b- I was never a drug addict. So I yeah. was like, this is easy. Yeah. Like this part's easy. The hard part is getting a job because, man, remember, I'm addicted to money still. Right. Like yeah. I didn't really overcome that. I, I, I regret spending most of my time down feeling bad for myself and reliving what I could have done with all that money. All you all you cared about was the money. Yeah, correct. Got so it. I. Uh, when I got out, I was still in that mindset. I was like, we got to go. We got to go. We got to go. We got to go. It was like it was real. It was like a manic period of my life. And all I knew now was like, I got to get to Hollywood. I got to I got to hurry up. I'm 26. Life's passing me by. Right. And now as an older person, you're like 26. You're, you're still a young you're like a kid. You're just starting. Yeah. So. Um, so, yeah, I got a job like waiting tables in Portland, living with my parents and then, dude, as soon as they, the parole officer was like, yeah, you can just, you don't have to come see me anymore. Just, you know, just, just check in uh, by mail and we'll be good. I was like, deuces. And I just packed my car up and I drove to 16 hours south to L.A. And I've been here ever since. Oh, wow. That was thir- 11 years ago. So you were able to have a place and everything or did you have? Yeah, yeah. I had a friend you know? down here and I moved in with him just in a shitty little house in Hollywood and just... Throughout the years, I think it took me about a year and a half to start doing stand-up comedy, um, but that had been in the back of my mind, and yeah, and you know, uh, it took a long time. It took eight, eight and a half years before the connect started to jump off, and you know, so I really put in my my time, and I set out what I accomplished to do, which was dedicate myself wholly to something that I actually like doing. Because I always thought, I mean, like. I could always go make money. Yeah. Like I promise you, and I'm not bragging, but I, I've I'm old enough, and I know so much. Within five years, if my whole goal was just to make money and get rich, less than five years, three years, I would be a millionaire. Like making money is really not that hard. It's and it's not the main driver of man, you know, man, mm-hmm. mankind. Identity is a bigger driver. So I was, I was like, look. I can always go make money, but let me see if I can make money at something I like doing. And, and you know, uh, thanks to the, the power of the Internet and, and podcasting, because I wasn't getting anywhere in Hollywood because it was already becoming very the business was already drying and up. You're, and it was getting old for you. You were getting yeah. stressed. It wasn't working. You were like it, yeah, it wasn't right. like you weren't happy, probably. No, 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 no. I was I didn't like taking acting classes. I would go into acting class and I would just go off script and just start making you're fun of shit. people. And, so the acting teacher was like, you need to go do stand up. So and, you know, the Internet was taking over. So I just saw the writings on the wall. I was like, OK, this business is contracting. Mm-hmm. You should go to something that's working. Right. So I've always I pursue what I like to do as long as it's feasible. OK. So I saw, OK, this is a feasible route. So uh, but yeah, you know, I'm headlining on the road like I do the podcast. I do vlogs and I'm working on something with Prime and. Uh, it's just like it's amazing. Good. It's amazing what's happened, and it's like it's all it's full circle. It's full circle now. I'm a completely open book talking about the past, and that's that's what like, you know, being real and expressing your emotion like that's story and accepting where yeah. you were. Yeah, exactly. At one point, yeah. exactly, and it's turned out to be totally relatable. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I yesterday I told somebody that I was gonna have you on my channel. They were like, "Wait, he's been in prison." And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> "Yeah." He's like, "I would have never guessed." <laughs> exactly. Well, that's what everybody <laughs> in prison said. I would show up on the yard, and they'd be like, they would like put the they would like put the basketball down. The black guys were like scratching their heads. They were like, "What are you?" Because you look like a federal prison type of dude. Yeah. Well, I mean, like a white, you know, the white collar crime. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I, I either look like I I robbed a granny's pension or I had a bunch.
Oh my god. Um, no, I didn't. I'm saying no, I, I, know. I, I look like that. Most white guys that in in state prison that look like me, like that, that have like some kind of like education, they're there for something creepy yeah. usually. Creepy, you know, I suppose, yeah. Uh, state prison is is full of scumbags. Yeah. Next time I go, I will go back to prison. Next time I'm going to the feds. No, we're not going to anywhere. No, <laughs> no you're not oh, going. Okay. To, you're going to continue to do what you're doing. All right. And we're not going to jail in prison anymore. Yeah, you're right. Ah, dang. It was fun while it lasted. But. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, and I would never have gone to prison if it hadn't been for that one historical time, you know. Because if this was now, if I was a kid now and I wanted to become a big time weed dealer, I couldn't do it. Because there's so much. Yeah. It's so much competition. It's, it's, it's finished, basically. Like, yeah. you have to either be in a cartel or own. A shop. A shop. Like, be legal. So, that's what's so interesting like about you know i call my buddy oh man it makes me tear up i call my buddy who my my partner my business partner who never got caught by the way you didn't you didn't know that <laughs> no but he was, was there for you right yeah yeah of course well he got out of the game i bought him out of his side of the business ah. you know like a year before i got locked up okay. but i told him i'm like man we're living in a historical moment this was like 2008 i'm like we're like the last generation of bootleggers mm -hmm. you know like the way that somebody could talk to their great great grandfather who was a liquor bootlegger back in the 1930s you know like that's who we were so i'm very proud of that i know that's right yeah. Yeah, yeah i know what you mean yeah i know what you mean was there anything else that you would want to share that you haven't shared no uh, can i do plugs <laughs> <laughs> can i do plugs not hair plugs um Go to, uh, yeah, just go check out The Connect with Johnny Mitchell. It's, uh, you know, we're all over the internet. Uh, if you want to see me do stand-up comedy, I got dates. Go to johnnymitchell.biz, johnnymitchell.biz. I'm in Toledo, Ohio, Cleveland, uh, New York City. I'll be in Austin, Texas in November. I'll be in Dallas, uh, San Diego in December, and then Zanies in Chicago in oh, nice. uh, so December twenty first. You're working, working. Yeah, Good yeah, for yeah, you. yeah. So Good we're going out. So go check John, Johnny Mitchell Biz for and the. And we're bits. obviously gonna plug in your, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. all your ads or whatever. Awesome, yeah. awesome, yeah. This has been so much fun. I know. Yeah. But you and I are always fun. Yeah. Yeah, we're pretty yeah. funny. Yeah. We got a report. Yeah, we're, we're gonna start a podcast. You're not down. Move over, husband. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. We're gonna start another one. Don't worry. Yeah, exactly. I'll be. I'm already out over the internet. You know, might as well. <laughs> exactly all right well thank you for coming on indicted tv my pleasure don't forget to like share and subscribe and follow us on instagram peace out <laughs>